This week, two incumbents are facing determined challengers. In nonpartisan Honolulu City Council, Councilmember Joy Monahan is seeking a second four-year term. And in the State House, incumbent State Representative, former House Speaker Calvin Say is facing his seventh challenge. Monahan versus Shigemasa for City Council District 7, and Say versus Allen for State House District 20. All four candidates are ready to take your questions and comments. Insights on PBS Hawaii starts now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahialani Richardson. Honolulu City Council District 7, which includes Kalihi, Mapunapuna, Salt Lake, Hickam, and parts of Pearl Harbor, has been called the epicenter of Hawaii's homeless crisis. The area is also heavily impacted by the beleaguered rail project. Tonight, we'll hear from incumbent Joey Manahan and challenger Chase Shigemasa, the two candidates hoping to tackle those issues on the Honolulu City Council. And then Democratic incumbent and former House Speaker Calvin Say and longtime challenger Republican Julia Allen will join us to talk about the issues important to House District 20, which includes St. Louis Heights, Palolo, and Kaimuki. We hope you'll participate in tonight's discussion. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org. Now, don't forget to call in your questions early for the candidates for Honolulu City Council District 7, since it'll be featured only during the first half of the program. Now, prior to tonight's show, there was a random drawing that determined the seating order and the order that we'll use throughout the program. Now, to the candidates. Chase Shigemasa has been involved in politics since 2010 and has worked as a legislative aide to State Representative Linda Ichiyama during the 2011 and 2012 sessions. In 2014, Mr. Shigemasa ran for the Oahu trustee seat in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs but was unsuccessful in his bid. Mr. Shigemasa is a business telecom specialist at Hawaiian Telcom. He's also a field supervisor for Omnitrack Group and a driver partner for Uber. Honolulu City Councilman Joey Manahan first ran for office in 2006 when he became state representative for the Kalihikai area. In his capacity as state representative, he was the chairman of tourism and served as vice speaker of the House of Representatives prior to running for a seat on the city council in 2012. Currently, as councilman, he's the chair of transportation and vice chair of budget. Good night to you all, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman, why don't I start off with you? Your district is so large, and it's yes. really hard to pinpoint the, the very main issues in your area, but you've walked it several times. So what would you say are the number one issues for such a large area? Well, the issues vary, uh, Mehalani. I would say um, for us, well, the district spans from uh, Ivalay, River Street, downtown, to the stadium, uh, Mackay of the H1 Freeway. Uh, so within it, you know, we have very diverse uh, areas and neighborhoods, uh, which include uh, lower income neighborhoods. We have the highest concentration of housing. Uh, we also have a large uh, military uh, base and population, as well as a lot of seniors and, and uh, um, you know, varying incomes. Uh, so the, the issues are very large and diverse, but they stem from everything from transportation issues, um, when I was in the state, the uh, harbors, the airports, um, as well as our schools and housing, uh, which are still issues for us today. Mr. Shigemaso, as, as you walk the district, what's the number one concern that you're hearing? The number one concern I'm hearing is the rail. You know, the rail, uh, as we know now, uh, we keep hearing different figures. Uh, the media keeps giving the public different figures uh, from six billion to 10 billion to 11 billion, and people are just getting upset. They want to know how can we finish the project, but finish it in a fiscally right manner uh, and may make our make taxpayers not be at the burden uh, for such a project to be completed. Uh, so that, that's the main issue that I'm hearing. I'm also hearing other issues, as, as I can uh, uh, say the council member has covered it as well, the other issues that I'm hearing as well. So if you were in the council and you were elected, I um, mean, you, you've got a lot of lawmakers, you have council members, you even have the state legislature involved. What would be your solutions for keeping the rail on budget going from now on and uh, making it on time? Well, I think what we need to focus on now is how to, how we can find a, fin a financial feasible option to pay for the rail. We have to be creative. 
Uh, there were uh, things that came about previously in the past few months. Uh, Hawaii News Now covered uh, David Callies, who's a professor at the University of Hawaii, and who said uh, he, he spoke of the term value capture. And what value capture is, is where we have a public infrastructure project which is going to benefit private landowners. Uh, when the mayor announced that he was planning to just go to Middle Street and we can worry about how we're going to find the funding uh, to go to Ala Moana at, at a later date, uh, these developers put their hands up in the air, hello, you promised us the rail. And so we have to make sure if, th th if these people are going to make profits, millions and millions of dollars, they should be able to, they should have to pay their fair share. Uh, that, there, that, that will br bring up their property value in, uh, in the end. Councilman, your thoughts on that and, and your thoughts on keeping uh, the rail project on budget from right. here on? Well, you know, first of all, we do have to ensure that we have a viable financial plan uh, moving on beyond Middle Street into the urban core, which is really the issue right now. Uh, getting us, you know, we have enough money uh, projected to get us to Middle Street, uh, but uh, getting from Middle Street to the Ala Moana as required by the federal, uh, full federal grant agreement that we're in right now with the FTA, the federal government, uh, requires us to build out 20 miles, 21 stations. Uh, so for us, uh, we need to find, we have to have a viable financial plan, which uh, basically the basis of that would be the general excise tax uh, extension uh, for, uh, which is used to fund uh, the majority of the project. Uh, beyond that, we also have, for us to be able to keep the federal funds without having to pay back the federal government, we have to complete, uh, as I mentioned, the, the 20 stations, and I mean the 20 miles and the 21 station uh, commitment that we made uh, years ago and that the people voted for. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I think uh, to uh, Mr. Shigemasa's point about value capture, um, I think it's a good idea, but in terms of uh, filling a deficit, uh, I'm just wondering how much we can uh, give away to developers and, and to be able to make up a billion dollar deficit. So I think we would have to give up a lot of land and uh, we may be giving up a lot more than what we bargained for in that kind of uh, circumstance. But we should be open to, to working with the developers and public-private partnerships. You know, everybody talks about this uh, tax extension, um, but state lawmakers, many of them, just shaking their heads, saying, you know, yes. we can't continue to fund this project. So how would the city council uh, work with the legislature on that? I think that's a, that's a very good question, Mahelani. And I think the last time when, when the city went to the uh, legislature, I don't think we went there prepared enough. Uh, we went there in there with the wrong numbers. Uh, and, it, and, you know, and understanding having served in the legislature, you know, I would be concerned too. Uh, and so in meeting with the House leadership and uh, just very recently uh, met with the House Speaker and uh, Senate President, what they want to see is, uh, again, a viable financial plan. What is the city willing to give up uh, if we are to extend the uh, general excise tax? Um, you know, what would it take uh, in terms of property taxes? They wanted to see us uh, at least run the numbers to show our sincerity and uh, our commitment to, to the project, uh, to say that if we had to pay for it with property taxes, they want, they want to know how much we would have to raise property taxes uh, in order to cover that kind of a deficit. So uh, some kind of variation on that, especially for the operation and maintenance of the rail. Um, that's you know um, what we have to figure out with the legislature. But we do need to do a better job in engaging them and making sure that they are partners in this endeavor. Mm -hmm. because Mr. Shigemasa, do you, do you agree with that? I, I agree to a certain point. Um, as the chair of the Transportation Committee, I think uh, more should have been done previously in the past by uh, Councilmember Manahan in regards to trying to find uh, way, different effective ways to uh, fund the project. You know, we're now where we are today, uh, and what has been done in the previous years uh, as at, at the Transportation Committee, I, I believe, I understand HART is semi autonomous, mm -hmm. but the Transportation Committee of the City Council uh, should uh, take an active role in uh, trying to help fund the project or looking at various creative ways to fund the project rather than just to look into raising the general excise tax. But what other creative ways would you have? I mean, for, uh, for someone watching, they might say, well, it's very, it's very easy to criticize where the project has gone, but what are the real solutions out there at well, this point in time? 
I think what we need to do now is we need to bring all the players to the table. And I don't think that ha that has happened. Uh, we need to bring everybody to the table, all the experts, and we need to figure out how we can fund this project. We need to consult the FTA better. We need to go uh, go and talk with the other governments, uh, city governments that have built these type of projects and that were successful, mm -hmm. and to see how we can mo model uh, what they have done and how we can do that to build our project and have a successful Honolulu Rail Transit. You know, another big issue uh, for the district is homelessness. I know you hear it uh, constantly uh, from many of the voters in the district. And, and you've advocated for urban rest stops and hygiene centers. How would that really help the problem of homelessness? Well, I got to admit, urban rest stops is not a housing solution. But what it is, it's a stepping stone um, and a tool to get people into housing. But what urban rest stops do is basically provide free showers and free laundry services. Anyone can come in uh, and basically take a shower and, and sign up, take a shower and, and then do their laundry. I think that's, that's critical, especially with the lack of housing that we have out there. There's a lot of people who have to live on the street. They have no choice, uh, but they don't have bathroom facilities. And so what we see is uh, people camping out near our waterways, Kapalama Canal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the idea stemmed from there uh, in dealing with the homelessness. But in, in Seattle, it's worked very well in terms of getting people into services and into housing because uh, right now the only tools we have is Sitlai. And it's a very, um, it's very traumatic, it's very negative uh, kind of experience uh, to go out there and sweep people uh, from where they're trying to sleep, I guess, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's just negative contact. So this way, um, you know, people come in voluntarily, it's more positive, uh, and so the interaction uh, would then lead, hopefully, to, to people getting interested in, in housing and bettering their, their housing situation. So it's not a housing solution. We definitely need to build the housing, but, you know, it is a, the first step in getting people into housing, I believe. Uh, Mr. Shigemasa, what do you think about these rest stops and hygiene centers, and what would be your solution for uh, curbing the homeless problem? Well, I, I agree it's a, step, it's a good step in the right direction, um, although I believe it's a Band-Aid solution. Uh, I believe that the city council should uh, push an initiative that I have come up with. Um, it's called the HELP initiative. It's, uh, H stands for uh, home, uh, home housing, getting them into a housing, E, education, L, labor, getting them to work, and uh, P, prosperity. When you connect the three dots, then you have prosperity. I think the city needs to focus on more housing first projects. Uh, we need to figure out, get them into houses first, and then work with them with services after that, uh, and get them in, to join the workforce and be an active member of society. And I think that that's not happening right now. Uh, homelessness has grown in the last three years uh, to an extent, it's a crazy amount of number of homeless that we have. And every community member in the district, you know, they, they bring it up at all the neighborhood board meetings that what are we doing about homelessness? You know, they're grilling the governor. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to focus on housing first programs because I think when you get them into a house, uh, you're able to work with them better. Uh, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to come to a sense of knowledge that uh, the whole, each individual and family who is homeless has a story. You know, everybody's different. They have, there's, there are different reasons that they're on the street. Either it be uh, the financial problems, either it be they lost their home, or either it be they have drug addiction. So we need to put them in housing first, and then we can focus on finding a solution uh, to what services they need and on, get them on the road to mm -hmm. prosperity. You know, some people have advocated for managed camps. Where would you stand on that? I, I think uh, that would be a good idea to do. I mean, the, the we've, I've heard talks of another camp in the uh, Sand Island area, but uh, we need to definitely discuss with business owners and the community as to where to put such a camp. Because um, every community at this point in time is saying, not in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and so we need to be more compassionate. Um, Mahia Lani, I wanted to also say that I don't believe the sit and lie ban is the compassionate way to go about do things. I believe in compassion without disruption. Uh, and so if elected to the city council, I would like to introduce an, a repeal to that law because I don't think it's just, I don't think it's right, and we can't be treating these people like they're a like they're uh, not people. 
And so these are people. These are people who have lives, and we need to work with them. Uh, Councilman, would you support a repeal of sit lie? You know, unfortunately, Mahalani, it's not our first choice. You know, again, it's it's a tool. It's a necessary tool, and it's a very unfortunate. Uh, but you know, without sit lie, um, you know, the Waikiki district, um, the Waikiki district, which is our economic engine would again uh, be subject to uh, illegal encampments the way they were at Kapilani Park. Uh, and it'd be terribly um, hard to market our, our economic engine to, um, to our visitors. And, and you know, it'd be, I think that this, you know, um, the, we, we were getting a lot of complaints from the visitors and, and it was very unfortunate, but you know, that's where the sit light really stemmed from uh, and the need for it. Um, and it wasn't something that we, really wanted to do we understood that you know housing is the ultimate solution but you know when you're 19,000 units behind uh, from experience in dealing with the uh, you know all the red tape that we have in, in government you know you got to break down the red tape you got to centralize the funding within either HHFTC or the Hawaii Housing Authority so that developers uh, can uh, tap into city and state funds and we can put out these uh, low-income housing projects uh, on a regular basis through an RFP process and really break down the, um, you know, the bureaucracy and the red tape that it takes for us to build the housing that we need. You know, I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, talk about managed camps. Yes. Uh, you know, there are people on the mainland who, who advocate heavily for them, even though uh, national homeless uh, advocates say that, that that is not the right thing to do. So where right. do you stand on these managed camps? So of the ones I've seen in Seattle, out of the temporary encampments that they have, I prefer to use uh, temporary encampments, and they're actually, um, you know, physical structures uh, built in a in a, you know, in a small parking lot type of area, where you have um, maybe a 120 square foot home, nothing, not, not more than that, uh, but um, you know, basically what it does is get people into a shelter or rapid, rapidly house people, so that um, you know, with with complementing uh, with a hygiene center nearby. You know, they can use the hygiene center to, to do their laundry, take showers, and then go back and, and go back into their home or temporary home until they can get into a proper house. And I think that is a practical solution for us here in Honolulu, given that we have a housing crisis, limited land, and um, you know, lack of housing. You know, we're starting to get uh, questions from our viewers, so I wanted to get onto the questions. And one uh, person wants to know, um, from you, Councilman Manahan, what trends have you seen in the district, and what's better and what's worse? Um, <clears throat> what's better and what's worse? Um, well, I've seen uh, the trend in, is really we've gotten a lot more homeless uh, folks, and I think that's that's uh, not so good. Uh, but that's because we've had Sidlai, and what Sidlai does is just basically just push people around. And so, because we are um, we've been friendly to to our homeless population, uh, we don't. Um, we don't have sit lines so much in, in the district. We have it at Kapalama Canal, we have it at Ala Park, uh, but you know, there's, there's encampments popping up everywhere. And really what we need to do is really you know, build some sort of uh, housing uh, for these folks to be able to get the services that they need. Uh, shelter, uh, I, I don't know that we have enough shelter space. Um, we may from time to time, but really I think it's, it's a lack of housing that, that makes it so prevalent. What about what's better in your district have you seen over the years? Well, I've seen a lot of the improvements. We did the uh, Farrington High School remodernization. That's amazing. So that's well underway, and Farrington High School is getting remodernized through a master plan that's going to take um, a few more years to, to build out. But you know, you can see the uh, immediate uh, improvements in the field right now that's happening, and in the buildings A and B, which we started in 2010. I'm very proud of that. I worked on that, and I was very grateful to be able to work on that. The other thing that I'm really very proud of is Kuhia Park Terrace. We remodernized all those units in those two big buildings in A and B, where uh, in the past um, I was getting complaints from re the residents about you know dirty water, not having enough hot water for their kids before they go to school. We had bugs in the units, and we even had a class action lawsuit against the state uh, to bring it up to speed. And so I'm very proud that we were able to uh, modernize KPT, uh, build uh, proper uh, housing units uh, and respectable units. Uh, where people now take a pride in ownership and, and owning their homes, and it's really built a sense of community. Um, I think the community's gotten a lot better um, in terms of uh, less crime, and people just having a place to live in that you know they're proud to call home. And I think that's very important. 
Mr. Shigemaso, what's, uh, what's one thing that you're particularly proud of in the district that you've seen happen over the years? And what's one thing that you feel has gotten a lot worse? Well, I'm really happy with the roads. You know, we, uh, we, all, we all see the, the roads that we drive every day are getting repaved. You know, that's one of the greatest things that are happening. Now, I agree with the council member uh, th that the homelessness is an eyesore. Uh, in our district and uh, we need to create viable solutions in order to address that issue. Let's talk more about uh, transit-oriented development. Uh, Moses from Nanakuli, uh, outside of your district, has a question for you both. But he said, uh, why isn't the City Council considering more transit-oriented development near Ala Moana? Your thoughts on that, Councilman? Oh, we are. We actually had a zoning and planning meeting today. So there's a lot of, there's new developments going up in Alamana all the time. Um, we just, um, there's, there's a new um, hotel being proposed right on the corner of, um, right in front of the convention center, uh, where, uh, you know, it's going to be the end of the, hopefully the, the 20, the 20 miles, 21 stations and increase, uh, r increased ridership. But, um, you know, there's going to be a new, a uh, hotel there that's being proposed as well as condominiums and and along with that some affordable housing tied to that we also approved a uh, another project close also to Alamana uh, 300 affordable housing units that are going to be built by Sam Koo uh, so there is a lot of transit area to development there's a lot and it's very transformative uh, where it needs to happen for us is in the corridor between Middle Street and Ivalet where we can really maximize on those opportunities there's large uh, swaths of land there uh, from Bishop and Castle and Cook where we can really develop um, you know uh, substantial housing uh, and new opportunities for everybody. Russell has a comment and uh, he wants he says that the reason for the homeless problem in Hawaii is the lack of rent control seniors cannot afford increasing rents. Mm -hmm. What would you say to Russell Mr. Shigemasa? I would tell Russell that yes, I believe the city uh, council should uh, explore options of a rent cap. I mean, uh, other uh, cities have done that uh, and have been successful. Um, I, I really think that we need to reevaluate the rental market. Um, we can't have everybody on assisted li on a, uh, assistance, uh, supplemental assistance, uh, just to afford to live in Hawaii. You know, I have a lot of friends who move away from home uh, because they can't afford to live here. And that's, uh, and that's sad. And we need to be able to retain the people that we have here uh, so we can have a vibrant uh, community that we've always had. You know, there's two issues here, uh, Councilman. You were talking about affordable housing for seniors mm -hmm. and then a rent cap, mm -hmm. as Mr. Shigemasa was yeah. talking about. What are your thoughts on that? So basically, you know, I think the city and the state really need to get active in, in investing in housing and working with developers to develop the housing and affordable rentals. Nobody's going to develop uh, affordable rentals because it's not feasible, especially for us here with added shipping costs of building materials, bringing, in, bringing them in. Um, it makes the cost of uh, development much higher. So for a developer, um, you know, the infusion of city and state funds would make it more feasible for them to be able to develop these projects. And again, that's why I'm advocating for the centri centralizing our funding, city and state funding, either within HHFDC, uh, the Hawaii Housing uh, Financial uh, Development Corporation, or Hawaii Public Housing Authority, to be able to uh, maximize also uh, other uh, sources of funding, low-income housing tax credits, um, rental housing trust fund, which the state has access to. Uh, but the state also has a lot of land along transit-oriented development, more land than the city for us to be able to develop. And then the other thing where um, we could make, an, make a difference is, you know, working with the schools and 21st century schools and putting housing on the larger uh, properties uh, like Puhale School right down the road. Uh, you can, you know, it's a big footprint where you can put housing for, for teachers. Uh, and that was part of the vision when we went through the school closures. Mr. Shigemasa, as you walk the district and you hear people talk about their concerns, uh, some of them are more uh, in my neighborhood type of concerns. I mean, you have the broad issues, mm -hmm. but then you also have issues that are, are really kind of hit close to home. What's a, what's a concern that you've heard and, and how would you propose to tackle it? Uh, well, some uh, just at the Salt Lake Neighborhood Board a month uh, recently, a neighborhood uh, a person, uh, one of our neighbors was a uh, not so happy that the light at the pool was out you know so those kind of neighborhood concerns uh, that come about and you know instead of the city saying we're gonna fix it in a month and we'll get back to you 
let's get in contact with you. Let's get it done right away. You know, I mean, some stuff, stuff like that needs to be done immediately. I mean, to uh, engage yourself with the community. And, uh, you know, a lot of other things that come about, too, are uh, in regards to what our district uh, on the outer line parts of the district on Cam Highway uh, and the, the road conditions there because of the rail. You know, I have a, a lot of people who are saying, hey, that road keeps coming up. It's, my tires are getting all messed up. And so stuff like that, you know, I mean, it, it, when, you, when I walk the district, I, I talk with people and these are the kind of concerns that I'm hearing that are, that are just, uh, uh, just a day-to-day -day, uh, neighbor talking to you next door. Uh, Councilman Manahan, what, what's, a, let's say, a, yeah. maybe not as a, an issue that you don't hear about necessarily in the media all the time, but it, it really hits close to home for a lot of people out there in the district. What's, what, what's one of those issues and what's your solution? I think for us it's traffic and pedestrian safety, whether you're in Salt Lake or Kalihi, I think those are the two biggest issues. Salt Lake, we have a lot of traffic. You know, we need more capacity on Salt Lake Boulevard. Uh, we're working towards that. We got the uh, federal funds programmed already for 2018 and 2019 to do the uh, widening of Salt Lake Boulevard. Um, that's a big, huge issue. Um, I'm very glad to have worked with the mayor to be able to provide that funding and that commitment uh, also with the local funds in 2018 and 2019. Um, the other issues uh, I find also very important to the district are Salt Lake Waterway, uh, making sure that the waterway is safe uh, from Right now there's odors, uh, but uh, making sure that the water is flowing uh, through the city infrastructure and we're coming up with a bill to address that issue to be able to allow the city basically to come on private property to help maintain the waterway. Uh, so that's uh, um, kind of coming online. The other issues uh, that are, uh, I mentioned pedestrian safety and, and traffic, uh, but along with that is parking. We get a lot of parking issues. A lot of people are trying to park in front of their homes who cannot anymore because there's too many cars on the road. Uh, I get a lot of those complaints on a daily basis. Uh, and also uh, what we're working on is infrastructure, proper infrastructure in transit-oriented development areas especially to be able to address a lot of the uh, lower-lying uh, flooding problems that we have in, in, in Kalihi. Councilman, if we, you know, if we could just give the both of you uh, the last words, maybe just 10 seconds or less, why should voters re-elect you? Well, you know, I... I I really believe, Mehalani, over the years that, you know, we've really put in the work. There's no substitute for hard work. And hopefully um, people can see, um, you know, the work that we've done, Farrington High School modernization, Cahia Park Terrace, some of the uh, largest uh, projects or, or issues facing the state at the time, we were able to tackle in a short amount of time. Now I'm trying to um, uh, handle the uh, infrastructure issues, building rail, as well as more capacity. and resurfacing our streets and putting in the necessary infrastructure that we need for the future. Mr. Shigemaso, why should people vote for you? Well, Mihail Ani, I believe we should give voters a choice. Uh, voters should, uh, this November, should have a choice of uh, the way government is now and a new direction, a fresh perspective as to how we can uh, manage our city. And so I think uh, that's why uh, voters uh, this November will go to the poll, uh, go to uh, uh, their voting booths and uh, vote for me and elect me into office so we can uh, get that fresh perspective, that new direction at the city council that the city needs at this time. Mr. Shigemasa and Councilman Manahan, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Well, before we join the candidates for State House District 20, we want to show you a Hiki No story produced and written by students at Moanalua High School, loca located in Honolulu City Council District 7. Dustin Palea has always had a love for science. His unique way of thinking and a love for learning has made him into the ambitious student he is today. I love science so much because I like understanding how the world works. I just want to know why things are the way they are. I remember when I was in preschool, um, my dad and I used to watch the Discovery Channel and one of my favorite shows was the Mythbusters. And I guess that kind of sparked my interest in science. So I did experiments at home like baking soda and vinegar to do like rockets. It started out with little experiments. We tried to make flaming jelly one time. We used to light bottle rockets up, you know, everything was basically science when it came to fun. I was a young kid and I guess as you get older they just get more complex and this is where I am today. Dustin decided to put that love into his senior project, a class required for Moana Lua High School seniors to get the Board of Education diploma. 
the whole purpose of Senior Project is to get the students to stretch and challenge themselves and do something different. His project is really new, it's cutting edge, it's not what a typical project is. Dustin was able to work with the University of Hawaii in testing out graphene, a material discovered in 2004 that is opening new doors to sustainable technology. I want to be able to use science to change the world in a better way. Our goal is to find more applications for graphene, just use it in a way that it hasn't been used in before. I don't know, just expand the boundaries. You'll get faster computers, it'll be in your cars, it'll be in all of your like devices for like the health or, or, or devices within hospitals that help people um, live better. Uh, it'll be everywhere. It's a privilege having Dustin here. The younger you are, you kind of have this like innovative mind and you know that that innovative mind you come up with ideas all the time. Well it's really exciting to see any student, any young person make an impact right away or at least contribute to the effort and who knows where he can go. He's almost going to be able to write his own career. And while he's pushing boundaries in the scientific world, Dustin is also using his project to change himself. I've always wondered if other people were doing the same things as me. I guess through Senior Project kind of forced me to get out in the community. My advice is just put yourself out there. There's people like you. And while Dustin's determination will inspire those around him, he will continue pursuing his dream to one day change the world. I'm Adara Panetta from Moana Lua High School for Hikino. <laughs> Welcome back. We're now joined by the candidates for House District 20, which includes the areas of St. Louis Heights, Palolo, and Kaimuki. Democrat Calvin Say has represented State House District 20 since 1977 and served as Speaker of the House for 13 years until 2013. He's a member of several committees, including the House Committee on Education and Energy and Environmental Protection. Mr. Say holds a bachelor's degree in education and is also the president of Kotake Shokai Limited, a family-owned small business. And Republican Julia Allen currently works as a legislative aide for State Senator Sam Sloan and has previous work experience in a family-owned retail business. Her community service includes work with the Pololo Lions Club, Neighborhood Board Number 5, and the Hinamaka Board of Directors. This is Ms. Allen's seventh run against Representative Say. Now before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at the demographic breakdown of House District 20. State House District 20 is made up of 27,132 residents from the communities of St. Louis Heights, Wilhelmina Rise, Pololo, Manalani Heights, and Kaimuki. The median age is 43 years. The racial breakout alone or in combination is 34% Caucasian, 67% Asian, and 22% Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. There are 6,012 families in the district. The average household is made up of 2.9 persons, and the median household income is $72,434. 92% of the residents are high school graduates. 39% have earned a bachelor's degree or higher. The median value of an owner-occupied housing unit is $691,200, and the median rental is $1,406 a month. Now, during the introduction, uh, when I talked about you running seven times against Calvin Say, you kind of looked at each other and gave a little chuckle. I know you know, know each other very well. Uh, when someone asks uh, seven times, what makes you think you can win this time around? Well, what's important is actually being out there running and having a voice in the community. I think it's what people are looking for, is that they know that there's another choice. And so why should people vote for you uh, when Calvin Say has been in office for such a long time? I think it's time we do have new people there. Um, we don't have term limits at our state, and we don't have a initiative, referendum, recall, and so there's no other way for people to make changes unless they change in an election. So it's important that I stand up and do it. Representative Say, why are you so dedicated to this district? And you know, for voters out there who, or, or people who might not vote at all and say, you know, I don't vote because the same people get elected year after year after year. What would you say to them? It's probably my values that I incurred when my growing up in the district and also the fact with my grandparents. We were from the island of Kauai, rice and taro farmers. Farmers, knowing that, is hardworking. But more importantly, when my parents moved to Palolo, that's when I really began to appreciate and understand the dynamics of the district 
that I was born and raised in. A very good case in point is that I grew up with a lot of friends from Palolo Housing. These individuals were the low income residents and families. And I'm very proud to say that a lot of them today are very successful. And one of the families was John and Ernie Cruz and Guy and Desiree Cruz. My point to you is that the values that they have shared with me makes me feel really, really compassionate in addressing the low income of Palolo Valley, middle class income of Palolo Valley to St. Louis Heights and will luminarize the higher income. So you've you got an extreme. Mm -hmm. And my idea was how Calvin Say can bring it all together. Ms. Allen, what values do you bring to the table and what do you feel are your best attributes if you're in office? Well, I have worked at the Capitol for a long time. I do understand how it functions. I've worked as a legislative aide, both in the House and in the Senate. And I understand the functioning probably just as well as Calvin on that level, though uh, he's obviously been in leadership. But there's an understanding of a view that's more conservative, uh, willing to speak up. And it's one of the things when you have such a strong majority caucus that actually keeps their members quiet. Uh, they're less likely to speak up. And I think we're looking for somebody now who is able to do that, to have be independent, a, a different voice. Representative, do you see, uh, let's say, diversity within the Democratic Party, within your own caucus? Oh, yes. From the progressives to the liberals to the conservatives, yes, there is. And uh, I can very honestly say that maybe that was one of the reasons why I did not get reappointed as a speaker. I can truly say that I was trying to do my very best on behalf of the KK Okaina in regards to the unfunded liability of the state of Hawaii in regards to the pension and to the health fund issue. It is an issue because, like I say to a lot of families as I do walk the district, out of every dollar, 75 cents is already earmarked for salaries, pension contribution, health fund contribution, and finally, debt service. The more bonds we float, the more we have to pay on the debt, just like taking a loan out of a bank. You know, you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. losing your leadership position. Uh, what did you le learn from that experience? What I really learned is that you have the highest regards and respect for your members. They're all coming in idealistic sometimes that we can do the changes so rapidly. And sometimes they get caught up that, yes, let's do it now and don't worry about it afterwards. I've always tried to share with them, it's gonna be awfully difficult. Why? When a legislation is passed, as an example, think about it. Last year we passed medical marijuana. Where are we today? Department of Health is having a difficult time in the execution. We don't have the staffing for the laboratory. We don't have the individuals that's going to be doing the security. We don't have the resources that we were supposed to put last year or appropriate funds last year to implement it. Mm -hmm. Ms. Allen, well, you know, uh, Representative Say mentioned medical marijuana. It's already in place. Uh, you have a lot of business owners who are now trying to figure out the dispensary issue. If you were elected, how would you handle uh, medical marijuana moving forward from now on? It is a very difficult issue. I think what Calvin mentioned is true because we pass laws without really the understanding of what is going to be required to make that function. And because generally when you look at the medicine, you look at it's handled by a pharmacy, it's measured, it's controlled, and there is no way to do that today with how we're looking at medical marijuana. It's a very difficult thing because you'd have to have control on the growing, the conditions, and, and the, pro the end product. And I think we lack that ability. Uh, we're starting to get some questions from yes. our viewers, a lot of questions actually. And one viewer wants to know about overtime abuse. Um, what would you do about overtime abuse in terms of our government workers? Overtime o abuse occurs when we don't have the staffing requirements by contract. What we really should be looking at is that the abuses occur when we have this highest three years of one salary is based upon your retirement. So as an example, if an individual with the Department of Public Safety is making 50000 and him, him, he and his friends decide to say, you're going to be retiring in three years, why don't we get you some overtime so you hit the $75,000 threshold. We have tried to address it and we are looking at it very carefully 
and also negotiating it very carefully with collective bargaining, the executive branch and the legislative branch. Ms. Allen, is this the right way to go? Well, I think that uh, the bigger problem really is then over time is the fact that we pay people even when they haven't worked and the bigger loss is actually being people paid and then we can't collect what they got paid. That is where DAGS had a serious problem that's been ongoing for a number of years. And people look at overtime instead of where the bigger losses are that we aren't able to collect. Uh, Susan <laughs> from Molokai, uh, obviously outside of your district, but a state <laughs> issue, wants to know about the homeless problem. And she said, what happened to the suggestion to use a mothballed Navy ship for housing for the homeless? Your thoughts on that? And just overall, Ms. Allen, your <laughs> thoughts on, on trying to tackle the homeless problem? My overall thought on the homeless problem is we tend to look at it like that way as a bit one big group of people and it's not. Instead of breaking it down to who is homeless and really identify them, who is sheltered, not sheltered and why and what are the services that specific person or a group of people need. We need to break it down further and we need to have a more comprehensive look where we bring in government at all levels, agencies, whether it's federal, state, in the city and county and bring in the business groups who are actually impacted by it and the social service agencies so that they all have an input. It needs to be a more inclusive approach to it than what we're doing right now. A representative, I, I think the point that Susan from Molokai is getting to um, when you're talking about a mothballed uh, Navy ship is, is putting homeless in a segregated area. Would you advocate for that or what would your solution be? Well, my solution, and it's not just my solution, a group of members of the House introduced the omnibus bill. And this omnibus bill dealt with the preamble of the issue of homeless, that's one. The second point was that we had to find a dedicated source of funding. And that dedicated source of funding was increasing the conveyance tax. Number three, a committee that is set up with legal minds in addressing the civil rights of the homeless versus the general public at large. You have to address this because it is always after the fact that the county or the state is sued in court. What do you do with the debris or the clothing or the you know, tents that we accumulate? Do we store it now? And I think we have to store it. Fourth, we're supposed to address the issue of also having a yearly summit. Give the people of the state of Hawaii a status report come up with a summit so that people can participate. And fifth, the thought would be, how do you get homeowners to open up their homes? And that is an issue that I think collectively we all have to work together in a comprehensive manner rather than targeting it and coming up with silos. So that was the approach. Right. I, yeah, I see that it's very difficult if you take a large group of homeless people who are homeless for different reasons with different problems and put them all in one place. Uh, because some people may be homeless because they're drug addicts, they may have mental health problems, and you go and put them all in one place and you're not solving that problem, any one, their specific issues. Uh, we have an interesting question from uh, Dean Hammer, and it's really a social question for both candidates. Uh, what is your stance on accommodations for transgender employees and citizens in Honolulu? What about locker rooms, bathrooms, etc.? Your thoughts, Representative? But from a very simplistic point of view, private bathrooms for all private individuals, meaning transgender. It's just that one bathroom for one individual going in. So you will have to have more individual bathrooms rather than a urinal or something like that, just private bathrooms per person. From a cost perspective, is that realistic? I would say it, it could be, and it would address the civil rights issue that we're talking about because uh, you don't have a lot of people who are very disturbed with transgender being in a particular <laughs> you know, six uh, bathroom. So having individual private bathrooms would be my approach to this particular issue. Ms. Allen, your thoughts on transgender accommodations? I think the issue has been overblown. <laughs> that in general, if you break it down, um, do lesbians want to go use a boy's bathroom? I think not. <laughs> I mean, you know, and you break down the groups. Um, it, what it comes down to is is somebody who really is truly transgendered, they have changed their, their sex now. They have, and they would be using the one that's appropriate to them. So 
I think we've just made a problem that maybe didn't exist. We have another question about uh, <coughs> low income residents and, and you know the concerns about there's a concerns about affordable housing and basically access. How would you help the low income residents in your district? The bigger problem with the low income residents is it keeping the cost of living in the community so that they can stay there. Most our community is older and um, there are a lot of elderly people and they want to be able to stay in their home. So it's more of those, how do you make it possible that they can afford to stay there and be cared for in their own homes? I think that's the bigger issue that we're facing. Mm -hmm. Representative, say you've, uh, you've advocated for giving more support to caregivers. Um, yes. How would you do that? At this point in time, first and foremost, in addressing the question, you would have to find state property that is available. Secondly, then you'll have to go through the permitting process, community input, and seeing are the residents willing to have you know, a low income housing such as Pololo housing in their particular district. And third, I would recommend that we also consider that for caregivers that you just stated, we would have to find housing for them also, or come up with laws to allow a caregiver to stay with that particular family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Representative Say, uh, we've got a couple questions about where do you live? And do you really live in the district? Yes, I do. At 1822 10th Avenue, born and raised in o on Oahu, living in Palolo for 64 years. I'm proud to be saying that. And I must say this, I'm also very proud of my wife, who has spent time with her parents as a caregiver. If I had a choice today, I would still continue to say to her, stay where your parents are and help them. And that was the culture and the values that I was brought up with. Mm -hmm. What do you make yeah. about the fact that people continue to question this, even though uh, you've answered many times that, that you live, that you do indeed live in the district, that there continues to be this uh, general suspicion on yes. if you really do live in the district? My response is very simple. It's been 10 years now that I've gone through these trials and tribulations from the county clerk, which ruled in my favor, the county board of review that ruled in my favor, the circuit court that ruled in my favor. These are all appeals going up to now, guess where I'm at, the Supreme Court. I probably feel that I'm the trailblazer for present and future legislators in determining what is residency. And at this point, I think Judge Nakasone's decision saying that it should be left with the state legislature, I truly believe in that because you do have a committee known as the Credentials Committee in evaluating and analyzing and investigating all of these statements. Your thoughts, Ms. Allen? Calvin lives where Calvin says he lives. Okay. <laughs> so it's not an issue for you? Not at all. <laughs> uh, let's move on to, uh, we've got another question from Moses from Nanakuli and he wants to know about solar energy. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Ms. Allen, on, on encouraging a solar energy use in Hawaii and reaching these energy goals for the state? For those who, who want solar energy, I think it's great. We do have the sunshine. Uh, not all of our homes can adequately handle it. And I think we do need to have other choices. Personally, I like natural gas. I have a natural gas water heater and natural gas cooked up because my husband does the cooking. He loves to cook and he wants natural gas. So I think we do have to allow for choices in it, and there are a lot of ways to handle it, but I'm definitely in favor of those who want solar having it, yes. Uh, you know, on a broader level, Representative, uh, yes. these energy goals are very, very high. Can the state meet these goals? I would say they're ambitious, okay? And they're just goals. Goals that we want to achieve within that deadline of the year 2020, 2030. The thought is that if we can move towards that goal, that's where we're improving the less dependency on fossil fuel. In regards to solar, it is a great source. It is a great source. And the question will be in the next decade, how do we address the extra energy that is being generated during the daytime? And that is the storage batteries. I think someday what we should be doing is that if we are gonna be at the state of the art in achieving the goals, maybe for condominiums, and apartments and public housing, storage batteries will be part of their overall component as far as the planning and permitting. Uh, Adrian from Kaka'ako has a question about the economy. And um, Adrian says, what would you do to make the Hawaii economy work for young people so they don't have to leave the state? There's this issue of the brain drain. Representative? 
That's a very fascinating question because uh, sometimes the general public doesn't want change. When we had a proposal for a regional biohazard lab tied to the Center for Disease Control, there was total opposition mm -hmm. because it was bringing in invasive viruses to the state of Hawaii for research and development. That's the type of jobs I think these young kids really want. Other areas that we should be looking at very closely is robotics and also for future in the virtual reality area of the, of the production of theater, media, et cetera. And it's, it's clean. And what about you, Ms. Allen? Your thoughts on, on getting people once they graduate from college or even after they graduate from high school to really stay here and, and have good paying jobs? What we need are more small businesses allowing people to develop new ideas to support that. It's very difficult for people to get a business started here. And though my husband and I have had our own businesses, I also know the difficulty it is in, in trying to employ people and, and all the regulations that we have involved in it. But we need to support younger people starting out and finding ways that they can be funded. Uh, the one thing about our culture is we tend to really jump on a lot of the new technology the one reason the digital phones were first tested in Hawaii is we people here accept that very quickly. We accepted the bank machines before any other state did on a different level. So I think it's a good place for that kind of development. What about, uh, if, if you can expand on that, Representative? Where would I expand on that particular area would be the area of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Why agriculture? It's because you are utilizing your land, you're preserving your ag land, but more importantly, you're producing something. The blemish crops that we have, you could make it into something else as a value added product. But it is just one segment out of many that we are discussing because we have the most brightest kids here that do want to come back. In the medical profession, it's another area also that we are trying to get the best and brightest to come back. But the difficulty, like I shared with some of our constituency, is it tort reform, medical malpractice insurance? All of these come into play as making, making it obstacles for these individuals to come back. I wanted to move on to one of the proposals from um, Governor Ige, and he said he will once again propose to increase uh, a series of taxes. There's the gas tax uh, to pay for state road projects, uh, which are sorely needed. Um, what is your stance on these proposals? If he's looking for 35 to 40 million to replenish the highway fund, my thoughts would be to just take it out of the general fund. No matter how you look at it, you're affecting the consumer in one form or a matter. The tax increase will affect the consumer. Just take it out of the general fund, which is the general excise tax. Ms. Allen, yeah. would, you per, would you advocate for these uh, no, increases? I would definitely oppose those. Uh, the, the bill that failed this last session, it was to raise 50 million over a two year period. That's 25 million a year. And right now, they're about to spend 19 million just doing a test on having a mileage fee instead of a gas tax. And so, we're throwing money one place that seems unnecessary and, uh, and also ends up double taxing a lot of people. And so, yes, I would oppose it. We also right now have federal funds, matching funds, that we're failing to use on a timely business, and that is a much larger number. What we need to, to do is use the funds that we have more effectively because I think it's, the number is... Very, 450 million, Calvin probably knows the number better than I do, that? That, they, that they have, that they have, are really not using appropriately on a timely basis. We had a couple Please. more minutes uh, left and I just wanted to get to the last topic of rail. Yes. Um, and Ms. Allen, would you support an extension of uh, the Oahu half percent excise tax surcharge to finance uh, now this continuing rail system? No, I think we would be throwing more money into a big dark hole. Uh, that, that every time we s extend that f uh, fee, what's happening is that we're just becoming such a costly project, we're never going to be able to totally finance it. We're going to end up st stuck on paying for something that we can't afford to even maintain. How would you vote Me? if that came yeah. to your desk? I would probably have to support it once more. And what I would say to the general public is this. 
the federal government has already stated for the record that if you don't continue on with this project, we may punish you by asking that you return the $1.9 billion. So the choice for the general public, here we're chasing 1.5, and we have to, if we stop it, you're going to, you know, it's fine, but you're going to lose that $1.9 billion that they had given the state of Hawaii. And finally, the choice will be that with rail, what other alternatives do you have if you're going to have two major projects on the central Oahu Plains for those particular families, meaning transportation? What is it going to be like when I watch the news in the morning that one accident may create a gridlock? And this is just another option or alternative, and for me, it's similar to the Super Ferry. Well, Representative Calvin Say and Julia Allen, thank you so much. Uh, Super Ferry, another topic for another day, but we appreciate you being with us tonight. You're, you're very thank welcome. You. Thank you. Well, next week, we'll hear from the candidates running to represent State Senate District 19, which includes Eva Beach, Eva by Gentry, Iroquois Point, and a portion of Eva Villages. Can Democrat Will Espero hang on to the seat he's held for 14 years? Or is this the year for Republican Kurt Favela to take over? Then we'll talk about a charter amendment up for vote in November that would extend term limits term limits for Honolulu's mayor and city council members. It would also add term limits for Honolulu's prosecuting attorney. That's next week on Insights on PBS Hawaii. Thank you so much for watching tonight. I'm Mahialani Richardson. Ahui ho.